Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans, and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. Acts chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, New Living Translation. Hello, I'm Victoria Kay. Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. We're excited to be with you today as we begin a new series on Anchored by Truth. So to announce the series and tell us why we're doing it, we have R.D. Fierro back in the studio. R.D. is an author and the founder of Crystal Sea Books. R.D., you've entitled the series, Paul's Places. By Paul, I'm sure you're referring to the Apostle Paul, not the last name of the lady who produces frozen fish products. The Apostle Paul, of course, started out life named Saul. But sometime after Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus, Luke tells us in Acts chapter 13, verse 9, that Saul was also called Paul. So, R.D., maybe the first thing we should tackle is the rather famous name change. Well, before I comment on that today, I would like to add my thanks to yours for all the listeners who are tuning in today, whether they're listening on the broadcast or the podcast. We're grateful for anyone and everyone who will devote a part of their day or week to take time with us and study the Bible. And as you have suggested, since we are going to be spending a lot of time during this series talking about names, perhaps it is appropriate to spend just a minute thinking about and talking about one of, as you put it, the most famous name changes in the Bible. The Apostle Paul started out life in the city of Tarsus with the name of Saul. And all of the initial references to Paul in the book of Acts use the name Saul. Chapter 13 of the book of Acts is the first time that we actually hear him called Paul. Before that, in the book of Acts, this man is mentioned many times, but during those references, he is called Saul. And after chapter 13 in Acts, the only name that is used for him is Paul. And this is the person that we know as the Apostle Paul. And maybe we should point out that name changes are common in the Bible. Abraham's original name was Abram. Abram means the father is exalted. Abraham means father of multitudes. Abraham's wife was initially called Sarai, but her name was changed to Sarah. Sarai means Jehovah is prince. Sarah means princess. Obviously, God gave them these name changes to indicate the change he brought about in their lives. They went from being an elderly, childless couple to being quite literally the father of multitudes and his princess. But the Bible does not tell us that God gave Paul the name change, does it? No, it does not. In the case of Saul slash Paul, It seems very likely that Paul himself decided to change how he was called. You know, Saul is a distinctly Hebrew name. Remember that the first king of Israel, this is talked about in the book of 1 Samuel, remember that the first king of Israel was also called Saul. And even though King Saul didn't do the best job as being the king, King Saul still held the distinction of being the very first king of Israel. And also you need to remember that King Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. Well, Paul's father was also from the tribe of Benjamin. So it's possible that when Paul was born, again in the city of Tarsus, 
It's possible that his parents decided to name him Saul to hearken back to Israel's first king. You know, in certain respects, having your son named after a king of Israel, well, that would have been a matter of pride. Just as today, people will often name their kids after famous people of the day, though in America it's rarely royalty. In America, it will more often be a famous entertainment celebrity or sports figure. But in England, the names of kings and queens are still commonly used. Right. The name Saul actually means asked. But likely the meaning of the name was less important to Paul's parents than the fact that they were naming their son after the first king of Israel. Because again, Paul's father was from the tribe of Benjamin, and that first king of Israel, King Saul, also came from the tribe of Benjamin. And the birth tribe was very important in ancient Israel. Now again, as a reminder, the name Saul is very distinctly Hebrew. The name Paul is not a Hebrew name. The name Paul is actually Roman, and the meaning of the name was, quote, little. So, you know, it's possible that as Paul began his ministry, largely within and to the Gentile world, Paul thought that using a Roman name would create fewer barriers to him and create fewer barriers to the receptivity of his message. And it's also possible that after his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, that Paul was frankly a little less likely to think so highly of himself that he wanted to continue to allow a link to be drawn between himself and a former king. So using the name Paul may have been a natural expression of the humility that characterized Paul's life after his conversion. And that's not a bad lesson for us today. Any of those of us who have had an encounter with the living God should certainly recognize that humility, when we think about ourselves, is in order. Agreed. At any rate, even though Paul began to think about himself far differently after his encounter with Jesus, it is very consistent with God's pattern that God used this newly humbled man to write about half of the New Testament. Well, Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verse 11, quote, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's from the New International Version. So Jesus humbled Paul considerably. Before his conversion, Acts chapter 9 verse 1 says, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciple. Someone who is breathing out murderous threats doesn't sound very humble. No, he doesn't. But afterward, that same man thinks so differently about himself that he starts using a name that means little, rather than a name he shared with a king. Quite a transformation. Yet God then uses that humbled man to write 13 or 14 of the books of the New Testament. We say 13 or 14 because many commentators think the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, but that isn't certain. No. The author of Hebrews does not name themselves. Now, there is some internal evidence within the book of Hebrews that Paul was a very good candidate to be the author, but that's not an opinion that is universally shared among biblical commentators or scholars. Now, probably the generally accepted opinion today is that the Apostle Paul most likely wrote the book of Hebrews But he did not assign his name to it because, again, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. We can say with great confidence that Paul wrote at least 13 books of the New Testament. And in most Bibles, the so-called Pauline epistles will appear in order after the book of Acts. Now, of course, epistle is just another word for letter. So when we talk about the Pauline epistles, we're just talking about, really, letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. And nine of the 13 Pauline epistles are designated in our Bibles by geographic names. And those names include the names of six different cities and one named Roman province, which is roughly equivalent to a modern state. There are only six different cities because two of the cities received two different letters. Right. The cities of Corinth and Thessalonica each received two different letters. So in our Bible, those letters are designated 1st and 2nd Corinthians and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. 
Now, the other cities that are named in our Bibles where Paul sent letters are Rome, Ephesus, Philippi, and Colossae. And while it's not easy to translate those ancient locations precisely, we can say that roughly three of the cities that received letters from Paul were in today's Greece, two were in the Roman province of Asia, that's modern-day Turkey, and Rome, of course, is in Italy. At least Rome hasn't moved, and we all have a pretty good idea of where it's located today. And Rome was in the same place during the times when the New Testament was written. So given that the series is going to be largely about Paul's places, why did you select that passage from the books of Acts as our opening scripture? Only one of the places that was mentioned in that section corresponds to a city to which Paul sent one of his epistles. Well, the section from Acts that we used as our opening scripture, that's a really nice example of one of the big points that we want to make in this introductory episode of this series we're calling Paul's Places. Now, it's true that of the locations mentioned in our passage from Acts, only one of the locations was ultimately the destination for one of Paul's epistles. But the series of places that is mentioned in that passage gives a great overview of what the eastern half of the Roman Empire looked like during Paul's day. And therefore, that passage begins to help us see how the gospel began to spread from Jerusalem and spread worldwide. Matter of fact, the gospel is even continuing to spread to this day. So the spread of the gospel began at Jerusalem, but of course the gospel didn't confine itself to Jerusalem, just as Jesus had said. That spread of the gospel is continuing even to our day. Our opening scripture is part of the description of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit began empowering Jesus' disciples for their upcoming message to take the gospel, the good news, to all tribes, nations, and tongues. We have to remember that in the 24th chapter of Luke, Jesus told his disciples, quote, It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven, unquote. That's from the New Living Translation. Jesus gave that message to his disciples after his resurrection. Right. So Jesus told his disciples to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came and filled them with power. Well, the Holy Spirit did come on the Pentecost that followed Jesus' resurrection. Pentecost was actually an annual holiday for the Jews. It was one of the Jews' three primary festivals. So every year on Pentecost, Jerusalem was filled with Jews and proselytes from a wide variety of places, literally from around the Roman Empire. So, just like we heard in our opening scripture, at that particular Pentecost, following Jesus' resurrection, there were, quote, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, etc., Well, if you step back and you listen very carefully, you find out that whoever was doing the talking in that passage from Acts, they are very familiar with the layout of the Roman Empire. And when the speaker was describing their wonder that some humble fishermen, few others, from a backward part of the Roman Empire could speak perfectly in so many foreign languages, well, they actually were giving a description of the Roman Empire in a very coherent way, beginning with the extreme eastern edge of the empire. Parthia, in the mind of the writer of Acts, would designate this empire, which extended from India to the Tigris River and from the Persian desert to the shores of the southern ocean. One of the reasons Parthia was listed first was not only because it was on the extreme eastern edge of the Roman Empire, but also because Parthia was a power almost rivaling Rome. Parthia was the only existing power which had resisted Rome and had not been defeated. The Parthian domain lasted for nearly five centuries. The Parthians spoke the Persian language, as did the Medes, who were listed next. So Parthia was the very edge of the territory that formed the Roman Empire. Right. And, proceeding westward from Parthia, the speaker mentions the Medes and Elamites. The Medes and the Elamites were essentially located in the territory that today we would call the nation of Iran. Elam was bounded on the north by Media, 
and on the east by Persia. It was bounded on the west by Babylonia, and Babylonia, also called Mesopotamia, which was the next name on the list. Well, Mesopotamia was in the location of what we would call today Iraq. And so, just by looking at any map today, we can see that Iraq is adjacent to Iran, but just west of it. So, the person who was doing the talking in that passage was actually performing a sort of geographic inventory of the eastern part of the Roman Empire. They started on the extreme east and moved west until they mentioned Judea. Well, of course, Judea, that's modern-day Israel. And then they continued west further in basically a straight line through places that are located in modern-day Turkey. And then the speaker switched down to the northern edge of Africa, which, remember, at that time, the northern edge of Africa was also conquered by the Romans. And they finished up their list by mentioning Rome itself and then a couple of widely separated areas the island of Crete, and they mention the Arabs, and the Arabs would have been from what we would call today Saudi Arabia. But here is the major point that we want to make, at least for this episode. All of the places mentioned during the description of the Holy Spirit's activity at Pentecost are places that are easy to locate on both modern maps and the maps that were current at the time. In other words, the geography we hear about is real geography. It's not just geography that is familiar to biblical scholars, but to anyone who is familiar with the Roman Empire as it existed in the first century AD. We often mention on Anchored by Truth that one of the four lines of evidence that supports the inspiration of Scripture is that Scripture contains reliable history. While history consists not just of names and dates, but also of places. And as a quick reference to just one of the lists of places named in the New Testament, shows the places the Bible mentions are real places. This is illustrated very well by the Pentecost episode, but we will continually reinforce the point as we move through this Paul's Places series. Well said. You know, one criticism that is sometimes hurled at the Bible is that the Bible is just a collection of myth and fairy tales because it contains descriptions of supernatural things, spirits, angels coming and going, people rising from the dead, etc. But what the critics fail to recognize is that those descriptions of admittedly supernatural activity are firmly embedded in a framework of historical details, and that framework of historical details can be easily tested and confirmed. So the critic wants us to believe that the writers of the Bible books, like Luke, who wrote Acts, They want us to believe that Luke, he sweated and he strained to get the minute details of history and geography right, but then he just sort of gratuitously tossed in all these supernatural events in an attempt to create, I guess, what some people would think was a kind of pious fraud. And one of the things that greatly militates against that being a reasonable position is that the pious fraud that Luke and other New Testament writers were creating was the description of a brand new religious faith. And to create a brand new religious faith in the Roman Empire was essentially illegal, and therefore anyone who did so risked being put to death. And many Christians in the first and second century were put to death for exactly that reason. People living within the first and second century in the Roman Empire who were expected to be willing to state Kaiser Curios, which translates to Caesar is Lord. But after coming to faith in Jesus, Christians couldn't say that. The Christians had to say Christos Curios or Jesus Curios. They had to say Christ is Lord or they'd say Jesus is Lord. Christians can only confess one person as Lord, and that is our Lord and Master, Christ Jesus. So essentially in the first and second century within the Roman Empire, Christians were considered to be disloyal, unpatriotic, if you will, because the Christians would not affirm what the Romans considered to be the most fundamental test of loyalty to their state. The Romans wanted everyone to declare that the head of the state, Caesar, was their lord. A great example of someone who paid the ultimate price because he wouldn't declare Caesar to be the Lord was Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. Polycarp was the Bishop of Smyrna. He was born in 69 AD and died as a martyr in 155 AD. 
After he was arrested, Polycarp was brought into the inner city region of Rome. The proconsul pressed him and encouraged him to denounce Christ. He refused time and time again. He was threatened in every way imaginable, yet he remained steadfast in his confession of Christ. Eventually, the Romans asked Polycarp, quote, What harm is there in declaring Caesar as Lord? Unquote. His response was, quote, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Unquote. After that, the proconsul who was interrogating him realized that Polycarp was not going to deny his faith, and that constituted rebellion in the minds of the Romans. They had to make an example of Polycarp, so he was martyred. Right. Sad, but right. So when critics blithely tell us that the Gospel writers and the other New Testament writers like Paul weren't risking anything when they included their supernatural assertions alongside their seemingly mundane details of history and geography, those critics could not be any more mistaken. The New Testament writers were not only risking their livelihoods and reputations, they were risking their very lives. They knew that. They knew what they were doing. And so they took extra care to get everything right. And that's one of the reasons it's important for us to take a little time and study something about the details of the history and geography of the New Testament. If the New Testament writers sweated over the details of, quote, little things, well, we can certainly have confidence that they were also reporting truthfully when they described supernatural events, like the ascension of Jesus like Paul's resurrection of Eutychus from the dead at the city of Troas. And that's why we want to do the series on Paul's places. Taking the time to investigate how the New Testament treats geography helps people see clearly that the Bible is faithful and accurate. It's even faithful and accurate in those areas where many people might think accuracy isn't that important. But as we often point out, because the Bible is the Word of God, we must be able to see that it is consistent with what we can observe about the world and universe around us and what we can know from human history. If the Bible were not accurate with what our ordinary observations tell us, we would have little reason to insist that it came from an omniscient and omnipotent God. Right. So as we've seen today, the opening verses of the book of Acts contain details about geography that we can investigate. And when we do, we will confirm that the geographic references contained in the text, even though they are incidental to the primary point, I mean the primary point of that description in the book of Acts was the arrival of the Holy Spirit. So the geographic references are incidental to the main point and are not only accurate with respect to place and orientation, but they are also accurate with respect to historical dating. What are you thinking about? Well, for example, several of the places named Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, all those places that are named there are located in the nation that today we call Turkey. Cappadocia, for instance, was a province originally of the Persian Empire, but it was eventually incorporated into the Roman Empire in 17 AD after the Romans had conquered the territory. But in the 4th century AD, because of shifts in the political landscape, the Roman province of Cappadocia began to undergo significant boundary changes and realignments. Well, the same thing was true of all these named regions. Phrygia, for instance, essentially disappeared entirely in the 7th century AD. So, in the book of Acts, that list, those names, that was true in the 1st century AD Roman Empire but they did not remain that way as time began to pass. So again, this supports our confidence in the accuracy of the report that we receive from Acts. And as we proceed through this study of Paul's places, we will continue to see that pattern repeated. The Pauline epistles were written to a particular group of people in particular places. They were also written at a particular point of time. If the time and the place don't correspond, then we have no reason to trust the contents of the letter because we would have evidence the letter was fake. Fake documents are not reliable, even if they are created for an ostensibly good purpose. 
but we will see that the Pauline epistles are consistent historically. They match places we know about from secular history as well as biblical history, and we will see that many of the concerns the letters address are consistent with what we know about the culture and conditions of the recipients. Yes. We're going to see, actually, that the book of Acts almost serves as a guide map, no pun intended, to putting the epistles into their historical context, both the context of secular and redemptive history. And for anyone who would like to get a preview of how the book of Acts has been validated as a source of accurate history, we would recommend that listeners go to our website, crystalseabooks.com, and check out our Facts in Acts series. Facts and Acts, like all of our Anchored by Truth series, are available there under the Anchored by Truth link. So, do you have any final thoughts before we close today? I do. In our day and time, a lot of people have moved away from regularly studying and reading the Bible, and they've especially moved away from studying the Bible's history and context. And that's a real shame for a variety of reasons but not the least of which is that it steals glory from God and it steals power from God's people. How so? Well, I often hear people say, even ministers, that we can receive power and victory through our Christian faith. We often hear of people praying that they might receive power and victory from God, and there's nothing wrong with that. No, there's not. We strongly believe that when people show an interest in God's Word, God will honor that intention. It's not that we should study the Bible just to be blessed. We should study the Bible because the Bible is the way God has used to bring us His truth, and that's a truth we all need. But we should also not be surprised that God provides us a harvest when we are willing to sow our time and attention to the only word that He has ever communicated down through the entire time that man has been alive on this earth. When we set our hearts on glorifying God, seek to understand Him through His Word, and trust Him to guide and provide, the more He will endow us with His Spirit and His power. This sounds like a great time for a prayer. Today, let's listen to a prayer that all of our lives will be illuminated by the ineffable wisdom that comes only from the Holy Spirit. Prayer for Illumination by the Holy Spirit Great and mighty God, You are the searcher of men's hearts and the only true joy for our souls. We worship gladly the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, You came to take away our spiritual blindness and to make us alive to things of God. At Pentecost, You confirmed Your presence in the world and established Your dominion in the hearts of those who belong to the Son. We praise you because you are the one who strengthens us against the powers of wickedness that attack our humanity. By ourselves, we could never stand against the wiles of the evil one. But in you we have victory, for greater are you than Satan who is in the world. Holy Spirit, you regenerate our hearts and bring light to our mind. Since you fully possess all knowledge and wisdom, you are the supreme teacher who imparts wisdom and give us the ability to absorb and understand that which you teach. Lord, we pray that we would be sensitive to your leading. Time and again you have gone before us to find the path that we should travel, and you have never left us, even in those times we have grieved you or resisted your work. We marvel at the grace manifested to us by you, abiding with us and with the angels cry, Holy, holy, holy is our God, and worthy to be praised. We bow before the light of our lives, the Lord of the universe, the Lamb of God. In Christ's precious name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. We hope you'll be with us next time, and we hope you'll take some time to encourage some friends to tune in also, or listen to the podcast version of this show. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalseabooks.com, where we're not perfect, but our boss is.